Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the Song of the Broad Axe and this is an intro set of comments for our study of the some 12 sections of this poem. I mean, think about the number of poems that we've already studied in the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass that have this kind of numbered idea from starting from Pomenoc, the very first, through obviously Song of Myself, although that one is a little bit different kind of a poem because obviously it's more difficult to kind of string together all those 52 sections, although obviously we gave it a shot, didn't we? And then of course, Song of the Open Road, and Brooklyn Ferry. We just finished, of course, with Song of Joys, although that one not put in numbers. We commented on the fact that easily it could have been put into sections. We're definitely going to see a very interesting argument here in Song of the Broad Axe. And just since we're at the title, can we just make two quick observations? Think about the role of the axe in classic text. The Iliad, of course, comes to mind. Think about the axe in the Odyssey and the very conclusion of the Odyssey, and we're going to be shooting arrows through the handle of an axe, right, and all of that. How about Metzenyahu, the classic? We love Metzenyahu in 303, don't we? How about his uh, chopping them down? That, that, that line that he borrows, of course, from the Jewish um, tradition, from the forest itself comes the handle for the axe. In that line, there's so much of Whitman's Song of the Broad Axe right there. That is to say, there is this complication of an axe. On the one hand, it is unbelievably useful to create. It is also a powerful tool to destroy. So we're going to see in this poem a certain kind of dichotomy that will not surprise us given our study of uh, leaves of grass to this point. Now there are some assumptions as we begin our study together that we just want to make sure um, have been articulated. The first is that at LearnStrong.net, uh, you have down the left-hand side been following our comments up to this point, starting with inscriptions and moving, as we said, all the way through uh, a song of joys. Um, that is to say, from the very beginning, we have made the argument that we are the stories that we tell. We are fundamentally the stories that we do not tell, right? We're the stories that we decide to accept. We're the stories that we decide to reject. And to that degree, we're going to continue to play the game now. Our learning theory is so important to us. That desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, as we often will say, the new, N-E-W, is the new, K-N-E-W, and we're certainly going to see this here, as especially Whitman goes back in time to study ancient civilizations. In some ways, we're going to see in this poem that Whitman is playing around with the question of civilization, which will make sense when we get around to why it is the case that so many of the poems and leaves of grass are an attempt to try to qualify civilization. We'll get to it in a moment. Now our annotative approach that we'll be referencing always asks three guiding questions anytime we meet a text. In 303 it's always the same. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Level three, how can I relate to this text in some meaningful way that I can qualify as learning? At level one we're simply summarizing. At level two we will divide into two different parts. At 2a, themes, messages. At 2b, rhetorical, poetic techniques that are used. Not what Whitman says, but how he says it. For example, we have not seen a tremendous amount of intentional rhythm and rhyme thus far in Leaves of Grass, and yet we'll finish here in a moment by reading just those opening lines of Song of the Broad Axe, and we're going to be surprised. Oh, there it is. So in other words, Whitman can play that game when he chooses to play that game. At level three, how can I relate? We also divide into two, 3A, 3B. At 3A, how can I relate to other texts that I am familiar with. Now again, we're going to start obviously with Leaves of Grass. And as you have been reading with me, I hope, to uh, up to this point from the very beginning in the inscription section, you are already hearing these amazing echoes that happen all the way through the text. And it's, uh, again, I'm going to fight the temptation at every line to not say, hey, do you remember back in, and then I'll go back to some passage, Although I will do that occasionally, I'm going to try and fight not doing that with every single idea or concept because it's certainly going to be self-evident as we get into this, into this poem. And then obviously other titles that come to mind. Notice I've already mentioned two in the Odyssey, well, the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, and then of course even a Metzenyahu song. There is, for us, 
a great reverence of all different texts, ones that we would listen to, obviously read, um, watch, right, and play if we're talking about video games and the like. And then finally, and most importantly in our learning theory for annotation, how can I relate to myself and to my own time and place? We'll certainly ask that question. Now, we're always assuming an awareness and an understanding of what we call our Big Five in 303. About any given text, we'll always ask, what does the text say about epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology, and theodicy? We'll go through them quickly. Of course, epistemology, what can you know? That is to say, you either are absolutely certain of what you can know, the only problem with that is you could be wrong, or you can make the argument that there is no truth or absolute of any kind, which seems to posit an absolute, what we call the performative contradiction. And so we find ourselves epistemologically somewhere in the center, what we call in 303 the fallibilist position. That is to say, about any given position, we say, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And it's that I could be wrong part that leans to our curiosity and our sense of wonder and awe. And obviously we're going to try to do that as we meet this poem of some 12 sections, right? Sociology uh, um, and psychology are going to follow epistemology and ontology, the study of being. Ontology, who are you? And by definition, how do you define who you are? That is to say, are you your body? Are you your mind? Are you some combination of the two? Whitman loves to use this term, spirit or soul. What exactly is he talking about? These are ontological questions. As we said, psychology study of the individual mind and motivations and, and apprehensions, concerns, anxieties. Sociology study of the group or the collective mind. Now that tension between the individual and the group will be central to our reading of the symbolism of this poem. So I just pointed out now. And then finally, many of you have argued, without question, the most important element, maybe we would say, of the Big Five, theodicy. Why do bad things have to happen in this world? Why can't we just live in a world where there's no pain and no suffering? Can we find meaning in suffering? As we've often said, Whitman's uh, theodicy is fundamentally, when bad things happen, no longer ask, why did this happen to me? But rather, learn to ask, why did this happen for me? We're certainly going to see this uh, uh, played out in this poem as well. Uh, finally, we're going to assume a familiarity from our very early introductory lectures to what we are calling the five P's or perspectives on Whitman. Whitman is person, no question. We obviously are considering as much biography as we can. Whitman is poet. Well, we've already commented on the fact that he's in here going to play intentional games with, for example, rhythm and rhyme. Why would he do that? Whitman is pedagogue. He started out as a teacher. He remained a teacher all his life. We're certainly going to see that in a set of lines like Broad Axe. Whitman is politician, especially his emphasis on democracy. This is central to our reading. No question here. We will sense that Whitman is longing, being some five years away from the beginning of the American Civil War, longing for some idea that can bring harmony or union to the union. And then finally, and significantly here, because he's going to play around with a lot of metaphysical ideas, Whitman is philosopher. And following from Socrates through his study of Emerson and all points in between, he'll be playing that game as well. And as we have said, the assumption is that you have your own copy of Leaves of Grass, the deathbed edition, and that you read it on your own and then you come to our comments to help supplement what you're already coming to terms with. Now, as we always like to do, we begin with our Nortons to hear a little bit about the introductory set of comments entitled Broad Axe Poem in 1856 and Chance Democratic Number no. 2 in 1860. This poem took its present title in 1867. From the 390 lines of the first version to the 254 of its final form, it has been much revived, uh, revised. Although the superb first six lines, and indeed the whole poem's essential quality was achieved in the 1856 text. The most considerable change is the disappearance after the 1860 of 18 lines just before its final section, which exuberantly described the, ideals, uh, the idealized shape of the poet himself. Quote, arrogant, masculine, naive, rowdish, end quote. Among the several manuscripts related to this poem is a single sheet on which are set down in three separate columns about 400 words of jottings about the broad axe and its role in history. To Walt Whitman, now to continue with Norton's, the broad axe is an emblem or a symbol the emblem of a long, very train, quote-unquote, which is the poem itself, powerfully setting forth the attributes and shapes which the great instrument, both builder and destroyer, symbolizes, the creative strength of man deriving from the confident, independent masculinity and femininity which the poem celebrates. 
Um, and then we'll comment as, as well about the artistic skill in the opening lines of the poem and the way in which he will play around with rhythm, rhyme, and meter. We'll maybe even hear a bit of it as we finish this introductory set of comments. Now, just some basic background information as we get ready to start into this poem. It is a poem of great, we would say, complicated symbolism. So get ready. We, we are constantly in this complicated world of Whitman. And everything about Whitman is complicated, which is why he's America's poet. People who try to reduce America down to a single, simple concept meet Whitman and realize, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's America is simply complex, no question about that. This will be a study of civilization. That is to say, both its blessings as well as its curses, and now, sounding very much like a maybe Jordan Peterson, um, we're going to point out the fragility of civilization. It's so unbelievably fragile, and Whitman was acutely aware of this um, for reasons that are somewhat self-evident, because he is constantly struggling with what we have uh, earlier called Whitman's American struggle. And when we use that term, what we mean is, First of all, Americans are fundamentally independent. Don't tell me what to do. Anytime I begin a lecture on American literature, we always start there. Don't tell me what to do. We're very independent. We call it the Declaration of Independence. Not the, not the query of independence. No, no, no. The Declaration of Independence. But that isn't the full compo co composition of America either. Along with being independent, we're also fascinated by this idea of unity. The union, the union of the group. We are one. We are together, right? And if that's possible, that we can be both celebrating the individual as well as the group, that is to say our psychology, sociology of our big five, then how in heaven's name do you reconcile it when all of a sudden you have large numbers of Americans no longer willing to be united? Then what do you do? And this is a fundamental question of Emerson, Thoreau, and obviously Whitman is our, we call them the Holy Trinity of our transcendentalist thinkers, along with we would add obviously Emily Dickinson there as well. That fundamental challenge between the two, and of course for Whitman, I mean think about it, if 1856 is when he first starts writing this set of lines, we are what, five years out from 1861 to 65 is the American Civil War. It broke his heart and as, we'll, uh, as we've already said when we get to drum taps, we'll see just how much Whitman's heart is broken by the fact that it actually happened and that his book of poems couldn't keep it from happening. Broke his heart and obviously a poem like this will be one of those moments that Whitman is really hoping that the symbolism of the acts, both its blessings as well as its curses, can somehow resonate for all American readers. It didn't keep us from Civil War tragically. Um, uh, and, and of course the reason that we're fighting that, that great civil war is this argument, which to, to us today is just bizarre, that we can't even believe that people actually were willing to fight and die over the argument of whether you could own another person in the form of slavery. We're actually going to get Whitman as abolitionist, one of his strongest comments here coming now in this set of lines. We'll certainly look forward to it when we get there. There is, of course, this tremendous optimism, but as we've said before, it isn't a blind opti optimism. It's a, what we've called an informed optimism. Whitman is acutely aware, part of his theodicy, he's acutely aware of the really fragile nature of civilization and, of course, of the American civilization. His optimism, though, is that in the end, America will figure it out. This is his hope. And, and obviously, he made it through the American Civil War as a nurse himself. We'll have more to say about that when we hit the drum tap session. Uh, but he genuinely believed after the war that things were still going to be okay. Of course, the loss of the great captain, Lincoln, created a whole lot of anxiety for him and obviously all Americans. So we will be devoting then one lecture to each of the 12 sections. We will begin with the very first section, and as we pick it up, we will be shocked right away again with some of the interesting intentional rhetoric that's here and some of the maybe more O overtly and not so overt um, sexual kinds of references as well that will happen. Of course, if you've been reading with me since inscriptions, none of what we're about to read is going to shock you, although it will challenge you. We'll come back to study these and exegete these. Let's just hear the opening lines. Uh, Song of the Broad Axe opening lines. Weapon, shapely, naked, wan, head from the mother's bowels drawn, wooded flesh and metal bone, limb, only one and lip only one. Gray blue leaf by red heat grown, health produced from a little seed sown, resting the grass amid and upon to be leaned 
and to lean on. Well, some of you will argue, wow, we haven't heard lines like this at all in Leaves of Grass. And now all of a sudden we'll turn and ask, what is going on in Song of the Broadox? I hope that you're being challenged in our study. Come back. We'll go to section one in detail. Thank you.